we're up before dawn and check out of the hotel. Today we're leaving the land of the living on the east side of the Nile and going to the land of the dead on the west side of the river. The sun has just started to reach the Valley of the Kings. We're the first tourists to arrive. The coffee shop is still closed. The pyramid shaped mountain ahead is El Corn, the horn. We hurry to our first tomb, KV2, Ramses IV. We'll have it all to ourselves. Now we understand Salah's early morning wake-up call. The tombs were all excavated from the bedrock of the Thebian hills. There's a series of descending corridors ending in a vestibule followed by a burial chamber. Every wall and ceiling is decorated with hieroglyphics. These decorations have a very specific purpose. They describe the path through the underworld that the Pharaoh must take to achieve eternal life. They describe the challenges the Pharaoh's Ka, or soul, will face, and the spells and rituals the Pharaoh's Ka will need. At the end of the journey through the underworld, the Pharaoh's Ka will undergo the ritual weighing of the heart to see if his purity is enough to enter the kingdom of Osiris. With that introduction, we make our way out of KV2, eager to explore more of the Valley of the Kings. The place is still empty, all the better for us. Our next stop is KV62, the famous tomb of Tutankhamun. It's smaller and less extensively decorated than other royal tombs of the time, probably due to his short 10-year reign and his young age at death, 19. You can imagine this small space stuffed with grave goods to the ceiling when it was discovered by Howard Carter in 1922. The rest of the tombs in the valley were looted in antiquity. In the third intermediate period, 1070 to 664 BCE, there was a scandal when it came out that pharaohs had systematically looted previous pharaohs' tombs for their valuables. Tutankhamun's tomb escaped this fate because the entrance was buried under debris deposited by flooding and tomb construction. Our next stop is KV-9. This tomb was originally built for Ramses V, but his uncle, Ramses VI, later reused it as his own. We enter a long, sloping corridor leading to an anteroom. The ceiling is decorated with astronomical figures and constellations. This is part of the Book of Gates, a guidebook for the Pharaoh's soul to navigate his way in the afterworld and toward his resurrection. The pillared hall connects to the second corridor. The pillared hall is richly decorated with other funerary guidebooks. The second corridor leads to the burial chamber. It's decorated with the Book of Anduat. The corridor ends in the anti-room and the burial chamber. The sarcophagus of Ramses VI was shattered in antiquity and reconstructed in 2003. The face on the lid is a replica of the original, which has been in the British Museum since 1823. The burial chamber contains what's left of the outer sarcophagus. The rooms are decorated with chapters from the Book of the Dead and the Book of the Earth. The vaulted ceiling shows the double image of the goddess Nut, framing the Book of the Night and the Book of the Day. We make our way back up the corridors and are amazed at the, all the things we missed on the way in. Next is KV-17, the tomb of Seti I. This is one of the most decorated tombs in the valley. It's also one of the longest and deepest. 
The entry to the tomb consists of four corridors connected by stairs. The Wing Ma, daughter of Ra and goddess of truth, harmony, order, and justice. Four chapters from the Book of Gates. Betty the First, escorted by Horus, the falcon-headed god, to meet his parents, the gods Osiris and Hathor. When the pharaoh dies, the preparation of the body requires 70 days. At the end of that period, the pharaoh must be interred to begin his journey to the afterlife. If the tomb decorations are not complete, they will stay that way for eternity. Seti the First meeting the gods. Note the graffiti on the ceiling. Seti the First and the god Horus. We have arrived at the barrel vaulted burial chamber. The ceiling features a depiction of stars and constellations. The burial chamber is huge, supported by large square pillars, and every surface is richly decorated. Here are some details from the burial chamber. Seti the First and Osiris. The deceased Seti the First as Osiris with a green face some details from a side chamber and more graffiti. We start our ascent out of the tomb and notice all of the details we missed on the way in. Touch the unfinished goddess for good luck, I guess. Work in progress, the preliminary drawing in red and corrections in black. We're close to the surface. It's 450 feet from top to bottom. 745 and the tourists have arrived. We've had about 90 minutes of solitary tomb viewing. There are 11 tombs open to the public and we've seen the best four. And now it's going to be crowded. So it's time to head to the Valley of the Queens. The Valley of the Queens is on the opposite side of Elkhorn Mountain from the Valley of the Kings. On the way, we pass the Tombs of the Nobles, a necropolis for the rich and powerful in the New Kingdom. We're being very selective at the Valley of the Queens. We're only visiting the best, and that is the Tomb of Nefertari, the favorite wife of Pharaoh Ramses II. The quality of the paintings has earned the tomb the title of Sistine Chapel of Egypt. Special attention was given to her face, especially the shape of her eyes, the blush of her cheeks, and her eyebrows. After a flight of stairs, we enter an anteroom with inscriptions from the Book of the Dead. The east wall has an opening leading to a side chamber. The opening is flanked by Osiris and Anubis. The side room is decorated with offering scenes. On the north wall, a stairway leads down to the burial chamber. Everywhere you look, the paintings are exquisite. It would be nice to spend more time, but the tourists are on our heels and we have one more temple to visit. Our next stop is the mortuary temple of Ramses III at Medinet Habu. This temple was built during the reign of Ramses III, 1186 to 1155 BCE. It's one of the largest of the mortuary temples in Western Thebes. Mortuary temples were designed to commemorate the reign of the Pharaoh who built them. They were also meant to continue his cult after he died, a place to worship the Pharaoh who is now a god. Ramses III's temple is noteworthy not just because of its size, but also its 
reliefs depicting the defeat of the Sea People during Ramsay III's reign. The temple is also known for its deeply carved reliefs. The original entrance is through a Syrian-style fortified gatehouse. Inside of the temple is a small palace for Ramses III. This is his throne. The vanquished sea people are depicted many places in the palace and the temple. This passageway between the palace and the first court is known as the Window of Appearances. It allowed the pharaoh to show himself to his subjects. The first pylon facing the palace Ramses is shown defeating his enemies, and included is a list of conquered lands. Here the artist depicted the chaos of battle with swirls of bodies. It looks like Sala has done it again. We are all alone in this magnificent structure. Through the first pylon to the open courtyard. The court is lined with statues of Ramses on the right and papyrus columns on the left. The colors are still bright on the cornice. Under the portico are a parade of foreigners bringing tribute to Ramses. The second pylon leads to a peristyle hall. Her columns were fronted with more statues of Ramses III. Somehow the 3,000 year old colors are still vivid. Here a battle is depicted as a swirl of bodies. Here scribes count the number of the enemy dead by counting the severed hands. The third pylon opens to a hypostyle hall whose architraves and roof have long gone. The walls of the hall are filled with deeply inscribed reliefs. We turn around and work our way back through the temple, amazed by the vivid 3,000-year-old paint. back through the first two pylons to our waiting car. Since we're in the neighborhood, we have to stop at the Colossi of Memnon. They're the statues of Amenhotep III and stand in front of his ruined mortuary temple. Now we have a 90 minute drive ahead to Esna, where a late lunch is waiting for us on our boat.